Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, so um, as I was saying, this, this is a topic which I feel which is very personal to me. It, 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 it inspires me a lot. So I thought that, you know, a brother asked me to do a talk at, uh, at Sumsa. So I thought I would just um, share something personal. And, and of, the, of these things is, the, is my, uh, my own experience of, of learning Arabic and, and coming to a realization of the eloquence of the Quran. So, so we'll begin inshallah and perhaps through what I say, you know, I can impart a little bit of, 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 how, of how I feel. So, so this, is, this, is the, this is the claim that we make, most, that, we, that we hear all the time. The Qur'an is a miracle. And in Arabic it is, Al-Qur'an Mu'ajiza. And, uh, and this is a claim. And behind, and behind every claim there needs to be a proof. So, so we know, but before entertaining the proof, we need to understand the proposition or the statement. Al Quran Mu'jiza. Al Quran is is understood. This is this is understood. We know we know what the Quran is. But do we know what a miracle is? Mu'jiza. What is the what is the definition of a miracle? So let's begin with let's begin with that. So in in, in Arabic, miracle is mu'jiza. And for those who have studied some Arabic, Arabic words always return to three letter roots. And the roots are for this word, the ayn the jim and the zain which we can see up here so let's let's ask what what other types of words can be derived from this root we have ajiz weakness inability we can we can make a sentence we can say ana ajizun anil qiyam i can say i'm unable to stand we can also say ajuz someone who is old someone who is old who is physically weak so there are these there are these related words of inability weakness Related to the word of miracle, to the related to the word which means miracle. So let me ask you, what is the relationship between a miracle and weakness? How does inability, how does inability relate to a miracle? And that is, a miracle incapacitates those who observe it, and they are unable, they are weak to replicate the miracle. The miracle makes them weak. So this is the this is the relationship. Let us further define the meaning of a miracle. As you can see here, a miracle is an event or development that exceeds the norm in a way that cannot be replicated. So so I want you to, to focus on two points. You have a norm, something which is expected, and then you have an event that exceeds the norm in a way that cannot be replicated. So we'll take an we'll take an example of, which might be more familiar. So we have a norm. Athletes usually run the 100 meter sprint in about 10 seconds. This is about this is a norm. We have something amazing, such as we saw in you know the Beijing Olympics, Usain Bolt doing something amazing. He ran he ran the the um, the 100 meter sprint in 9.58 seconds, and this is something amazing, but it's not a miracle. It it has exceeded the norm, but perhaps. In two years' time, someone might run, in, run, run the 100 meters in 9.4 seconds, correct? But a miracle is, for example, an athlete running the 100 meter sprint in two seconds. If you ask a sports scientist, if you ask an athlete, would it be possible for someone to run the 100 meter sprint in two seconds? He would say, no, this is impossible. It would be a miracle. Okay, so this is, this is how we define a miracle. So let me ask you now. How do we know that the Qur'an is a miracle? So now we need to define the norm and we need to identify how did the Qur'an exceed the norm in a way which, is, which was not able to be replicated. So basically what I just said. So the norm, the norm was that during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there was an environment of eloquent Arabs. They, they all, they basically lived Arabic. They had, they, they lived in, in the desert and basically their, their source of entertainment, their source of everything basically was revolved around the language of Arabic. So they reached what we call the peak of eloquence in their language, the Arabic language. So it's, it's a bit different from the, so perhaps it's a bit different than the example of the 100 meter sprint, but it, perhaps imagine a society in which everyone was sprinters and the sprint was the most amazing thing in that world, make the equivalent the Arabic language. Is that understood? So, so now, 
the miracle is that the Prophet ﷺ came with the Quran, which was an which was an eloquent piece eloquent piece of Arabic, and it was so eloquent, it was so perfect that it was like a man coming down and running the hundred meter sprint in two seconds. The a, a people whose blood was Arabic could not replicate; they could not create anything like the Quran. So, and and the reason why was because. I'll give you a bit of a taste of it. It was, it was, it was a perfect piece of Arabic. So if I give you, if I give you an example, perhaps an analogy, every piece of literature in the world is a draft. You can make changes. You can improve it. You can move words around. You can change the structure, make it bit, a little bit better. But the Quran is a final copy. It is perfect. There is not enough, no change that we can do to the Quran to make it better. This is, this is, this is the, this is the piece of Arabic which, the, which the, the Arabs were given by the Prophet ﷺ. But perhaps, there, perhaps one can make a claim. How do we not know that it was replicated? Because you know, people, like to ask, people like to ask these questions today, so I, I'll, I'll entertain this question. And, and this, is, this is an important question, because we don't actually have to... If somebody asks you the question, you know, how is the Qur'an a miracle? You actually don't have to open up the book of the Qur'an and explain to them you know, because it's eloquent, because because the, the Arabic does this and that. You don't actually have to do that, because history unraveled in a way which proved the eloquence of the Quran. And let me tell you how. So, firstly, when the Quran was revealed, the Arabs of the Quraysh were, were they were under immense pressure to replicate the Quran. And why is that? Let me tell you why. Because the Quran was using eloquent speech to basically tell them that what they were believing was rubbish, it was falsehood, it would, it would lead them into the hellfire. All that they were doing was basically nothing. And they were doing, and the Quran was doing it with eloquent speech as well. So, eloquent speech was the weapon of the Arab, but the Quran was using the weapon of the Arab to, to basically make fun of them, make fun of the Arab. So this is one reason why they were under immense pressure to replicate the Quran. Another thing was the challenge. There were verses in the Quran which challenged the Arabs. Let them bring a discourse like it if they speak truly. Bring a Quran. They couldn't do it. Allah said, bring ten surahs. They couldn't do it. Allah says, produce at least a surah. They couldn't do it. So this was humiliation upon humiliation upon humiliation of not being able to produce or replicate the Quran. And lastly, the Meccan period was also a period of persecution where the Muslims depended purely on the Qur'an for their faith. So if the Quraysh could actually have come up with something even small to replicate the Qur'an, it would have destroyed the Dawah. But as we can see, the Dawah, the Islam is strong today. It exists. And this is a proof for the fact that the Qur'an was not replicated. So, so, and then finally, because they were, un, they were unable to write, they were not eloquent enough to replicate the Qur'an, they resorted to persecution and war. So we can see this is the way history unraveled to prove to us the Qur'an was not replicated. So now, that is, the, that is a, one of my favorite proofs to how the Qur'an is a miracle. Okay, but then now the question is, the Qur'an is a miracle. And it's a little bit different from the other miracles that happened in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Other miracles included the splitting of the moon, the, uh, the wailing tree, tree trunk, the, uh, the you know, water emanating from his fingers, these miracles. These are recorded, and some of them using ma uh, ma hadiths, which were traditions which were mass transmitted. But the difference with the Quran is that it's, it was a miracle at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and we have the same Quran with us today. So we might ask, we might ask, okay, I have the Quran in front of me, but then when I read it, and I'm speaking by myself, you know, I can't see the miracle. I don't know where the where is the miracle. So. So, so we might ask the question, how is the Qur'an a miracle? And this in fact is a question which people ask immediately perhaps 200 years after, after, the, hijra of the, after the hijra of the Prophet ﷺ. And why is that? Because as, as, a, as, as, the Arab, as Muslims spread, they spread up north, you know, towards, towards the Byzantines. Uh, you know, they, they established cities like Kufa and Basra, which are in modern day Iraq. Iraq. And the ability of Arabic started to, 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 de to decrease. And they weren't able 
to taste, taste the beauty of the Qur'an. So they started asking these questions. So then the science was developed. You know, the elements of the Qur'an can be partly defined. The reason why I say partly defined is because it's a, it's the, the truth of the miracle of the Qur'an can be never fully defined. But it can be partly defined so that we can taste a little bit of it. Such as the, the choice of words. The ulama say that the Qur'an is like a, the word they say is mizan. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a balance. If you were to take one word and replace it with another, even with, even with a very similar meaning, the entire, structure of the, the entire structure of the perfection of the Qur'an would be lost. So, it's, so the word choice is very important in the Qur'an. Grammatical and sentence structures, cho choosing the correct grammatical forms and the correct sentence structures are very important as well. Morphological structures, the form of the form of words themselves, not not sentences. So, so basically, what I'm trying to say here is that a deeper understanding of Arabic can give you a glimpse of the eloquence of the Quran. It's a big claim for me to say that I can show you the miracle of the Quran. It's like you know, because I'm still I'm still in that journey and trying to learn Arabic and read and understand and understand the eloquence of the Quran. But I can share with you a little bit of what I've learned. So, which inshallah I'll, I'll, I, will, I will begin with a few verses of the, of the Qur'an. So, so I'll begin with precise word choice. Does anyone, does anyone have any questions? Is everything clear so far? Everything's good? Okay, I'm not... Everyone can hear me, right? Okay. Uh, so, we'll begin with, um, begin with precise word choice. So let's see. Let's see that. Okay. So Allah says in the Quran, وَيَلْبَسُونَ ثِيَابًا Sorry, I'll stop. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وَيَلْبَسُونَ ثِيَابًا خُضْرًا مِنْ سُنْدُس. So this is this is in Surah Al-Kahf, and it means they will be they will wear green ga green garments of fine silk and heavy brocade. So. So the, the, word, the word of interest here is the word thiyab and it's being translated as garment, okay? We, now we have a second verse in the Qur'an Surah Al-Hajj. It says, وَلِبَاسُهُمْ فِيهَا حَرِيرٌ And their garments, there will be of silk. So these are verses describing the, what, the, what, the most, what the believers in the, in the afterlife in heaven will wear. So interestingly, is translated, this is the uh, Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran and thiyab and libas are translated as both as garment but there's a, there's a problem here because I mentioned that precise word choice if a word was taken and replaced with another this would mean that there's no such thing as a synonym in the Quran there cannot be a word with the same meaning with it in, in, in the Quran so thiyab and libas cannot mean the same thing so the ulama actually answer that, because according to according to um, normal Arab speech, according to my own knowledge, thiyab and libas would have very similar meanings. But the difference here is that thiyab is a decorative outer garment, while libas is a garment that cover and protect the aura. Okay, so this so this is a very important point. So then so then Allah strikes, he strikes a a metaphor. What does he say? He says about he says about the relationship between the man and the woman in marriage. He says, "Hunna libasun lakum, wa antum libasun lahunna." They are your garments, and ye are their garments. But now we know libas does not only mean garment. What does it mean? It means give me a, an adapted translation. They are your they are your innermost garments that protect the most precious and vulnerable parts of yourselves and ye are theirs so this really this really brings out the beauty of the relationship between the man and the wife in marriage so perhaps i can i can highlight a bit more it, it highlights the closeness and intimacy between the husband and wife because there is nothing closer to you than what is next to your skin and this is what is this is what is described by libas it is the innermost garment which you wear it's not it's not so it was not um, th uh, it was not thiyab, which is worn outside of your libas. So there's also there is also a trust because libas covers your most 
vulnerable parts, your aura, which is never shown to anybody. So, you, so, so the husband and the wife need to have a particular trust for them, for you know, for each of them to have to basically protect the aura of one another. So the the aura is is this is this is this metaphor for the most precious and vulnerable. Perhaps it could be your uh, your your greatest joys or your greatest or your greatest sorrows. These things which which are very private to you. So it, it really highlights the trust between a husband and a wife. Lastly, it's service and self-sacrifice between the husband and the wife. Because if you think about libas, it's something which you, which you wear. And if something comes to harm you, what is the first thing that gets hit? It's not you, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the libas. So it's, it, it, there's a sense of service and self-sacrifice in this metaphor. So, so, so basically, this... And, and what I'm trying to say here is that this meaning would not have been, would not have been given or, a, or apparent if what was chosen was the word thiyab, because thiyab is a different type of clothing. So the precise meaning given by this ayah would not have been given if the word thiyab was used instead. Do, you, do, we, do we see this? Okay? So also, so let's, let's, let's try a different example here. We have the deep meanings of, of words in the Quran. This is this is heard a lot. La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wusaha. On no soul doth Allah place a burden yukallifu greater than it can bear. Okay. So, so before we before we explore this word, let's explore a little bit of what is called uh, verb forms. <coughs> so, who knows Arabic here? Ya ya alam. What does ya alam mean? To know, it's, I guess. <laughs> okay. It means it means to know, okay. But then we can we can increase and and bring it to a different form. You alimu, add a shadda on top of the lamb. What does it become? It means to teach. What does to teach mean? It means to cause to know. So moving from one form to another gives the meaning of causation, okay. So this happens in this word here. Yukallifu means to place a burden, okay. And this is a very superficial translation of this word. Because when you actually look at the base form, what is the base form? It means, the base form is yak lafu. And this means, it means to love. So, so we can actually see moving from yak lafu to yukallifu can also mean to cause to love. So can you, can you, is, that, is that clear? Can you see that? So moving from yak lafu to love Yukallifu is to cause to love. So Allah places a burden upon you. He gives you, he gives you what is called taklif, or moral responsibility. He gives you the sharia so that you can obey Him, so that you can love Him. This is what this is what this this is what this word yukallifu here means. So if I give you an adapted translation, or on no soul doth Allah place a burden greater than He can bear, a burden which is a means to attain the love of Allah. So this is this is what we mean by 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 yukallifu. So so you so we might ask, okay, how how does a burden, you know, how, how can a trial be 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 a door to love Allah? An example an example could be Allah gives you Allah gives you a trial, something very difficult, and you are patient. You're patient and then you and you you, you, you take this trial. You you have you have sabr, you have a you have st you have steadfastness, steadfastness, and then, and then the trial is lifted from you, and then you say Alhamdulillah, and then after, and then from, and then, and then you understand, and then after the trial you understand the hikmah or the wisdom of the trial, that Allah has given you something, and then it's another it's another chance for you to say Alhamdulillah, and what can you do but love a God who gives you so much? He, he, lived, he has lifted a trial from you and in turn, you have, and in turn through the trial he has, he has given you an ability to grow and you just say Alhamdulillah and then you say I, I love you Allah this is, this, is the, this is the power of this of, and, and just a simple translation as place a burden doesn't quite give you the meaning of this word you can live you so is this is this, a, is this, is this understood? so, so we'll We'll, go, we'll, try, we'll try a different one here. This is about picking precise grammatical structures. 
So, so Allah says in the Quran, "Kullu nafsin al maut," and it's always translated as in most translations, "Every every soul shall have a taste of death." So al maut is is uh, translated as "shall have a taste of death," but let's have, let's take a bit let's take a let's take a bit of a, a, a a tangent here to try and explain something. We have something in, in, in Arabic called al idafa the idafa construction. And and here we have we have an example of an idafa ba'i'ul laban. This means this means the one who sells milk, the seller of the seller of milk. It's one one of the I know a, more more in a, in Arab vernacular speech milk is halib. But traditionally, in, in Laban used to be translated as milk, so I'm using that bit more classical meaning of Laban. Ba'i'ul Laban, the one who sells milk. So it's so. So Da'iqatul Maut is actually of the same construction. It doesn't mean shall have a taste of death. It means the one who tastes death. Okay. So, so that that's that's one point. One point which is very important to remember: Da'iqatul Maut does not mean shall have a taste of death. Rather, it means the one who tastes death. And this is a very important principle. The Yubafa construction gives a meaning of a job or a duty. So it's something which you have to do. It's like, just like a seller of milk has to sell milk to live, the nafs has to taste death. So, and finally, sentences without verbs give a meaning of the present tense. So this thing is happening right now. So, so to give you an adapted translation, every soul, kullu nafsin, whose, whose duty is to taste death, ذائقتُ الموت, ذائقتُ الموت, as I, as I explained to you, is the one who tastes death. So every soul whose duty is to taste death, is tasting death at this very moment. This is the literal translation of this verse. It doesn't mean every soul shall have a taste of death, rather it means what I said. Every soul whose duty is to taste death is tasting death at this very moment. You might ask, okay, how, how is that possible? I'm alive right now. So basically, it's, 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 it's exaggeration, mubalava, hyperbole. And from, this, and from this verse, we can take a few lessons. You know, if we're tasting death at this very moment, it means that death is so close. We don't know, we don't know when it will happen. And, and Allah gives us this meaning through this, just these, just these four <coughs> words. Just these, just these four just these four words. Also, if if a soul's duty if a soul's duty is to taste death, then there is no escape from death because there is no escape from duty. Does does everyone follow that? And finally, the use of the use of taste is also very eloquent because it gives a, it gives an indication of okay, what is the condition of a person upon death? Is he will he be tasting something sweet? Will he be meeting his lord, or will he be tasting something bitter, which would be which would be a, an unfortunate turn of events. So these, so we can see in these four, in just in these four words, kullu nafsin dha'iqatul maut, and the, and the also the just the the inadequacy of the translation. It doesn't quite give give the give the meanings which are required from 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 this verse. Subhanallah. And and we have okay, and we also have precise. Morphological forms. So here, this is another verse. Allah says, "Qad mu'minun," and it's translated as, "The believers must eventually win through." However, we know that "aflaha" is a past tense verb. It means they have already won, not that they will win in the future, but it's already it's, they have already already won. To say they will win is sayufli. Sayufli. Sorry, there's a there's a mistake there. It shouldn't be sayufla. It's uh, Sayuflih. So, so what is the meaning of this? It's a future event which will happen because because we need to remember that the Surah Surah Minun is a is a uh, is a surah revealed in the time of the Meccan the Meccan period. So it was a time of persecution, a time of a lot of a lot of trials. So Allah revealed this verse to the Prophet وسلم, which he he expressed to the believers. Qad aflah al mu'minun. So we need to we need to imagine this event. They're in such they're in such a you know, such a dire state. 
there, there, there are trials everywhere, they are being persecuted. All of these, all of the stories that we've heard, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes with this, with this, this great news. Qad aflah al minun. It's, it's not. It doesn't mean that you will succeed, but rather you have, you have already succeeded. Imagine that you have already succeeded, and this use of the past tense indicates to the certainty of this event. This event is will happen. There is no doubt to this event because, as we know, what what do we know about the past? The past cannot be changed. Whatever happens ha has happened and we cannot change it. So, so Allah is, is given an, in, an indication to the certainty of this event by, by, using the, by, using the past, by using the past tense. Okay? So that's uh, what, I've, um, what I've just said. And, this, uh, and uh, this is the final one where um, where, where this is a verse which Allah says, فَغَفَرَ لَهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ So, it translates as, So Allah forgave him, for he is the oft forgiving, the most merciful. So we often hear, so we often hear the, the phrase, الْغَفُورُ rahim الْغَفُورُ rahim numerous times in the Quran. So I'm going to tell you that there's actually a meaning behind the order itself of words. So how, 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 how do we understand this? Well, basically, we need to understand the meaning of maghfira, which is the root of ghafur, and also ar-rahim, which is rahmah, related to mercy. So al-maghfira, the definition of this is that Allah covers, covers up His servant's sins and His wrong, His wrongdoings. Okay, and then also ar-rahmah is Allah's bountiful giving upon His servant. So we can see it's the two different things. In one, in one sense, we can say. It's, a, it's something is being fixed and in the other sense a rahmah is something is being built so an analogy is that a dirty polluted vessel must be emptied before it can be filled up with with pure clean water otherwise the pure clean water will just become polluted once again so this is the this is the meaning of this order here Allah Allah forgives you he covers up your sins and then, and because you, you ask for his forgiveness, but it's not just that, he actually gives, he, he continues to give out of his generosity and love for you. He gives, he gives you, he, 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 he pours upon you his bountiful grace, all the blessings which, which, we, which, we, can, which, which we cannot, which we, which we cannot count. So, so I believe, so, so I, you know, I've, I've gone through many, I've gone through many examples, and um, I think at least five, I think five of them, perhaps maybe a little bit quickly, because it took about half an hour. So, but then, but if anyone has any, if anyone has any questions, and I, and I hope, you know, I hope through what, you know, through standing here and, and sharing, sharing a little bit about the, the tafsir or the, the, the interpretations of these verses that I have, I've, I've given you, I guess, a, I guess a, a taste of. Uh, I guess a taste of what a a, a bit a bit of a, a bit of education in, in Arabic in Arabic can give you. So you know I'm I'm sure many of you you know grew up in you know grown up here in Australia. I'm you know I, I, I've been here for a while. I used to read the Quran and you know I, I read the Arabic and I wouldn't understand and I look at translations and I read the translation. But then but then you know Alhamdulillah Allah Allah blessed me with the opportunity to to uh, to to go. You know, to go overseas, to to go and to go and study a little bit of a little bit of Arabic, to sit with to sit with teachers that really understood the you know the meaning of the Quran, those those people that really love love the Quran. In fact, one of my teachers, one one, uh, it's amazing. He would during Ramadan, he would actually he would actually spend the night every night in in the Hajjud prayer, reciting the whole Quran. So every night he would do this. He would stand in prayer and recite the entire Quran every every Ramadan. And it was, it was out of the, the generosity of God, I was able to, I was able to spend time with him. So, inshallah, you know, we, 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 all of us may have a have a taste of a little bit of this. And I'm sure, you know, some of you, are, some of you already know some Arabic. And um, and even even though if it's not Arabic, I know perhaps some of you, uh, maybe uh, you, know, you, you you all as university students doing particular particular. Uh, uh, you know, specializations in, in various fields, and we can say, okay, we, you know, we're doing, you know, we're doing this for the sake of Allah. 
but at the same time, what does it mean for us to do something for the sake of Allah? Is to do things, is to do things so that our actions bring us towards Allah. So if you're, if you're a student of medicine, you know, we, perhaps we, you, you, can, you can study medicine, but at the same time study the fiqh of medicine, or maybe the, the medicine of the Prophet Tib al-Nabawi. If you are if you're a student of accounting, you know, you can perhaps study the, the fiqh of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of bay, you know, sales and uh, buying, buying and selling the fiqh of riba, you know, things, things like these. So, um, so just, you know, just, you know, just, I'm just trying to do my bit. So I think we'll, we'll end here, we'll, we'll end with a, we'll end with a short dua, inshallah, and then perhaps we'll close for some, for some questions, inshallah.